and I think these kind of liberal movements that only fight for the minorities and minorities, like the upper class examples of oppressed groups, um, don't really represent fundamental progress towards like real liberation. I think, in fact, they actually give kind of a wrong illusion that we're safe now. And I think too many queer people and women buy into um, into this kind of false notion of progress on on a basis of social liberalism, and they forget that as as much as we can gain kind of these like liberal values and and rights in society, they can also be taken away really quickly without having fundamental changes in our system. Um, I think a really current news story. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. Is uh, of like gender discrimination is about Castor Semenya. She's mm -hmm. an Olympic athlete, um, an Olympic champion in the 800 meter run. She just basically lost this huge landmark case against the International Association of Athletes Federation, who basically ruled that she had an unfair advantage in running because of her abnormal levels of testosterone in her body. And she was basically told that unless she takes, um, takes measures, for example, testosterone blockers, that she would be losing her career and also losing her past achievements. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of um, artificial enforcing of a very specific version of what a person or a human's body is supposed to be like based on gendered lines. At the same time, we see that there's also sexism and racism interplaying in this kind of conversation because athletes like Michael Phelps have been really like celebrated for their natural um, uh, advantages that they have, like Michael Phelps, for example, also Olympic athlete, um, has like a double jointed ankles in his body and produces half as much lactic acid and the muscles as average athletes. And that's kind of seen as a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. But for uh, a black woman, it's like seen as like bad. And I think this is really rooted in a toxic understanding of gender and is really interplaying with racism and sexism. Uh, I think another case of really toxic uh, contemporary developments is um, that like that really threatens the security of LGBTQIA people and women is like the ideologies that the far right is propagating. Uh, both the I'm German, so in Germany we have the AfD Alternative for Germany. It's like a new proto-fascist right-wing party. It's very close to the FAD in the Netherlands, I think ideologically. Um, they have these like ideas of genderism. Um, uh, like emerging, they, they, they propose that there is this ideology, this gender ideology, um, which is kind of threatening Western society. And basically, w with that, we can see views of really conservative, like really conservative hardline views creeping back into society. Um, that basically, like straight uh, cisgender men are being discriminated against because we start considering outside. Um, of the traditional gender binary and because we call out rape culture and sexism and everything. Um, the AfD in Germany is participating in this like Demo für alle approach that's a, that's a popular front or like a right-wing uni united front of conservatives, Christian fundamentalists and fascists against um, the ideology of genderism, marriage equality and sexual education. And they propagate really outdated ideas of marriage and sexual purity as being like human nature and set in stone. Um, and that now, like us postmodern neo Marxists, are destroying all of that, right? Um, but I mean, these things are completely rooted in bourgeois ideology and bourgeois history. Um, and I think these are kind of things that the working class has fought for to abolish. And now these, these, these kind of right wing groups are really trying to re establish um, this conservatism in society. At the same time, we also see a lot of remnants of conservative thinking uh, on the left, like there's a lot of transphobic uh, like analysis floating around um, ideas of trans women being kind of agents of the patriarchy sent to invade males or female spaces. Um, at the same time, it's also, there's this idea that oppression of queer people doesn't really matter for now because with the revolution, it will just inevitably like fall and everything will be solved. And that for us to be now talking about how our identities and our experiences intersect with capitalism is kind of like divisive, right? And these kind of things make the left, unfortunately, often a really hostile environment for a lot of queer people and for a lot of women who can also be queer. <laughs> um, so um, I think we need to be having this conversation because as Marxists, we need to participate in emancipatory struggles of LGBTQ people and of women. I've already said that feminism made it into the mainstream in the last couple of years. 
And I would also like to point out that it's not just like a liberal bourgeois feminism, but that there's real like social upheaval connected to this as well. A lot of the anti-fascist organizing around the world today is, I think, done by a lot of queer feminist groups. We've seen this in the movement against uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, but also the responses to the election of Trump, you know, with kind of global women's marches. And there were some really liberal uh, bourgeois feminist op op opinions expressed there, but nevertheless, there's a kind of general tendency for, for movement against fascism to be, or against the far right, to be organized along these lines. Um, Yet, as I've also mentioned, that there's a tendency among the left to kind of distance themselves from identity politics and from intersectionality because it, they see it as like not the right analysis or not deep enough. And it may not be deep enough in some cases, but um, I think as Marxists we can step into these movements and actually provide them with, with analysis that, that is perhaps needed. And I think as Marxists we need to understand that the state um, that while this, like, as long as the state and class society exist, like, oppressions will not fall, but it doesn't mean that we, we cannot focus on any other forms of oppression than class oppression at the moment, right? Um, so we need to eject, reject ideas of uh, class reductionism. That means that fighting against gendered, uh, gender based oppression, like, the idea, we need to be fighting against the idea that uh, gender, that, sorry, that fighting against gender based oppression is divisive and that the only thing we need to worry about now is the working class and their economic situation. The interesting thing that I've observed in this kind of argumentation is often that um, it kind of presupposes the working class to be white, straight men, um, and like people of color are the working class, and women are 50% of the working class, more or less, and queer people are like the working class, right? Um, of course, of all of these, there's also bourgeois examples, but the majority of queer people are working, uh, are a part of the working class. And I think we live in times where like, um, there's these studies of, of, you know, in the UK, what is it, of everyone under 30, around like 30 to 40% or something identify something other than completely straight or heterosexual. And there's like, so, you know, we're massive parts of the population and to just kind of imply that the working class is only this, this like, straight men that are white is, I think, really outdated. Um, and we should definitely get away from that. Um, so, and we really need to reject this idea that um, with the revolution, that we just need to wait for the revolution and then sexism and oppression will fall. I think that's a immense oversimplification of a really complex process of a revolution. Like, the revolution is not a train ride where we get on in like a capitalist mess and then we wait for 10 minutes and there will be short like struggle and then we get off in like socialist utopia um i don't think this is the kind of um the, the view of this this particular group anyways but there are leftist groups that kind of conceptualize the revolution like this right um i think in state and revolution lenin talks about how um like the people after the revolution will still be capitalist people right like there will be generations and generations that will still be influenced by thousands of years of conditioning and and we need to already start like addressing these issues now. Um, so what Marxists should propose is that we start our analysis of oppression with the historical materialist method. That means that we examine historical development to understand how we got to the place where we are right now and also make certain um, analysis based on, on this and how we can fight oppression. So if we want to go into the Marxist understandings of gendered oppression, um, I think the like most central text is uh, Friedrich Engels's Origins of the Family, Private, Property, and the State. It's like a good place to start. Um, it's not everything, and I think there is lots of things. You know, this is like what 150 years, 1884. It was written 1884, so it's it's old, right? But still, we can <laughs> use it. Um, and there's and it's also good that you know Marxism is not a religion, so we can revise things and we can reconsider things, and it's fine. Um, so much of this analysis of, of Marxist or the Marxist analysis of gender-based oppression really comes from this work, um, and it Engels makes a really compelling case that actually women's oppression and structures of the family, as we know today, have not always existed, and in fact have not existed for most of human development. Um, from a modern gender studies perspective, we can also uh, assert that with that, um, like gender as we know it, has not always existed. Um, so I think at this moment I want to also like I've already made the acknowledgement that not everything in here is like perfect and, and peachy. Um, 
So, for example, when I refer to uh, to women, um, or when Engels refers to women, I think um, it's specifically as what the patriarchy sees as women. So, people that can um, uh, get pregnant and bear children, for the most part, right? And that's a specific Western analysis of it. But I'll get into that in, in a little bit later. I just wanted to point this out. Um, so, in this book, Engels argues that the oppression, as we know it, of, of women has not always existed and does not exist in all societies. Um, and uh, he bases most of it on the research of an anthropologist called Lewis Henry Morgan, and in particular his work, Ancient Society. In this work, Morgan conceptualizes human development um, as being kind of in three phases, uh, each of which is characterized by specific types of an economic set setup. These kind of three phases that I'm going to explain in a second are not supposed to be like 100% accurate as like one went to the other, went to the other, there's like a dialectical process in this, but it's kind of just a way to um, to give it a framework and to give it a kind of visualization, I suppose. Um, and the terms that are used are, from today's perspective, very problematic. Um, I'll also talk about this in a second, but the, the first phase would be savagery. Mm -hmm. uh, that means it's a, what we call today a hunter-gatherer society, so people kind of are nomadic, um, uh, organized in nomadic situations, private property doesn't exist, they have really small resources and based on that they move um, throughout the land um, without having really like a village system or something like this. After that comes barbarism, that means early agri agriculture and the rearing of cattle that kind of emerged 10,000 years ago and then after that is civilization and that's uh, characterized by private property, urbanization, class society and really like a high agricultural dependency. Um, so as I already said, this, um, this terminology is really outdated. I think Engels and Morgan were working with the linguistic realities that they had at the time. Um, and if you, if you read both Morgan and Engels, you can see that they actually have a high level of respect for these savage societies, right? Like it's the term that they used at the time, um, but it doesn't mean that it was used in a derogatory way of these people in particular. Um, but that being said, it's great that language evolves and that we can describe it more accurately today as hunter-gatherer society. So um, Engels argued that for most of human development we lived in a stage that he called primitive communism. Um, and uh, this is like a stage, a stage of human development that's mostly characterized by non-monogamous systems uh, or lineages, or so clans and tribes. And the, in this arrangement, every member of the community contributed to the survival of the clan Private property did not exist. Inst instead, all things were used by the clan, were seen as collective property of the society. And Engel states that in these societies, the, they were often organized through the maternal line, meaning that um, family structures were, or clan structures were organized along those who could uh, bear and nurse children, and that the closest male relative of a child was often actually not the father, but the brother of the mother, right? Um, so that's a kind of different system than what we're used to. And Engel says in, origin, in Origins, he says that um, all quarrels and disputes are settled by the whole body of those concerned. The, uh, the members of the tribe or individual, well, he used the term, terms gens, which is lineages or clans. So, um, sorry, I'll repeat. All quarrels and disputes are settled by the whole body of those concerned. The gens or the tribe or individual gens amongst themselves. There can be no poor, needy, communistic household, and the gens know their obligations towards the aged, the sick, and those disabled in war. All are free and equal, including the women. Uh, there is much evidence today that actually many hunter-gatherer societies, um, and many of these societies, they actually dependent on equity between all members of, of the clan or all members of the society, and that uh, children were often raised not belonging to one person, but they were kind of seen as a collective responsibility of the entire clan. Um, Engels points out a specific observation made by Morgan about um, indigenous uh, Iroquois nations in North America where basically they observed no, um, no hierarchy between the genders. There was a kind of gendered system and there was a labor division between what they considered men and women, but there was really no um, hierarchical, hierarchical approach to that. Um, but I think here, like what I just said, like these people were seen as men and women by Morgan observing it, but actually in many societies, um, 
like that we kind of project Western conceptualizations of gender onto them. In many societies in North America, for example, they didn't really have the same concepts of gender as we had today. They had more than two genders. There's this kind of concept that's still a remnant of that, of like two-spirit people. Um, but uh, there were, in some societies, there were as much as five genders or no gender concepts at all. Um, there's another example of the African continent, for example, uh, with the Yoruba people where there was basically just no gender system in place. And when colonizers came, they really tried to translate the languages that were there in order to fit this gendered system, even though it didn't exist in the first place. So there were certain like endings to names that would indicate certain anatomical features, but it wouldn't really constitute gender as we know it today. Um, and I think Morgan and Engels kind of um, fall short on this part as well. You know, they see people and they say these are women, but actually we, we don't really know what societies would have perceived them as. Um, um, okay, so back to Engels. <laughs> so while in this hunter-gatherers stage of human development, um, like there was equity between all members of the clan, um, but at some point started, classes started to arise, and that point was basically um, where the gender division of labor uh, kind of was solidified, right? And that happened when farming and agriculture developed, uh, as well as the domestication of cattle and animals. Uh, so men were now responsible for the breeding and holding of animals and control of the and in control of the farming, and for most of human development, it was possible to produce for the first time in, in human development, it was possible to produce surplus value. So now it was also for the first time there was a motivation to exploit the labor of other people, to get more and more surplus uh, that you can trade with. There was now a motivation for pillaging and war against other people because you could take what they have. And basically that's where classes started to arise and then also the state started to arise as a instrument of class rule to like in somehow uh, to somehow um, like manage these irreconcilable conflicts between the classes. And in this new system, the matriarchal clan line that I described had to be overthrown because basically men had a motivation to pass down their property to specific rightful heirs. Uh, so monogamy started to be enforced specifically for women. Um, monogamy is hence a result in particular uh, of a particular moment of human development and not just like it hasn't always been there. About this moment uh, in human development, Engel states, I quote, the overthrow of mother, right, of mother right was the world historic defeat of the female sex. The man took command in the home also. The woman was deraged and reduced to servitude. She became the slave of his lust and a mere instrument for the production of children. With the patriarchal family, and still more with the single monogamous family, a change came. Household management lost its public character, and no longer concerned society became a private sector service. It became a private service. Um, the wife became the, the head servant, excluded from all participation of social production. So with the overflow, overthrow of these communal clan structures, smaller individual units arose, which we now understand as kind of family as we know it, right? One man, one woman, a couple of children, and as I said, monogamy, especially enforced for women because um, it was like, it was clear that, well, if a woman was pregnant and gave birth, then it, that, that then there needs to be kind of proof that it was this man's child, right? So she had to be monogamous to him, but he didn't necessarily have to be monogamous to her. Um, uh, and this kind of social organization of the family has kind of arose uh, in that time, but it has kind of um, continued through feudalism and into capitalism. And Engels argues that the origins of the nuclear family, so man, woman, and a couple of children, can be really found in the development of the class system. And in capitalist production, particularly, he argued that um, there's a high, high, or that capitalist production is highly dependent on the family structure. Um, and of the oppression of women, because in this economic system, the family exists to ensure the reproduction of social classes and of economic classes. And that the demand for capital growth basically is increasing, and with that, um, capitalism needs more workers. So um, women need to have more children to provide more workers for the, for the labor force. And at the same time, they were also responsible for raising the children to be new workers, right? So there's a huge amount of unpaid social reproductive labor, 
that women need to do that capitalism really depends on not being paid and not mm -hmm. like that, that that all of this is done in the private household mm -hmm. that people are responsible for it um there's another dimension to it, which is that the bourgeois women had kind of different rules applied to them and that they really needed to produce heirs. So again, that there would be clear line of succession so that the bourgeoisie could pass down wealth and authority uh, through, through generations um, uh, of, of, of the family. Um, so bourgeois marriage became a really economic arrangement, right? Like there would be marrying into a different family because of economic reasons and not because of Love or something like this. <laughs> um, uh, another factor that we need to consider is that women of color and colonized women, uh, or colonized people of all genders, actually, really were like I think kind of fall out of this analysis to some extent, or they 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 would need a whole analysis of their own because colonized subjects were not treated the same way that that white women were, like um, like women on slave plantations and and like the the North American slave system had really completely different rules and like were treated in completely different ways. Um, and they were desexualized and resexualized in all kinds of different ways that really don't fit with the, uh, the European experience. And that would fill a whole talk on its own and I think we should have a talk about this at some point. But for now, this is kind of where my, 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 my note to this, this ends. Um, I would also like to point out that in Western culture, what we conceive to be men and women has changed over time. There's really obvious changes in, for example, what we see, see as masculinity and femininity. Um, but interesting, there's also, uh, like, we know that in the Enlightenment age, there was a kind of, um, w what happened was a medicalization of an anatomical differences to conceptualize a gender binary. Um, we know that, for example, scientific racism really came about with the need to give a justification for colonialism and for slavery, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was created to justify these systems of oppression. And at the same time, similarly, uh, the gender binary was enforced in medicalized ways, right? So in enlightenment medicine, uh, they they basically started to, to have this conceptualization of, you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, you know, that we're kind of almost fundamentally <coughs> different species um, and that, that one complements the other, you know, where the woman is, uh, weak and emotional and sensitive, the man is strong and providing and all of these kind of things. Um, and previous to that, actually, um, there was a widespread belief that men and women were had the same sex and that the only difference was that the men's genitals were outside and thus visible and the women's genitals were located on the inside. Um, so more and more contemporary research actually accounts for a complete deconstruction of like even the belief that we have a binary in the biological sense, right? There was this kind of thing in the 80s and it's still very pre prevalent that we say gender is, bio uh, gender is like in your head and sex is biological and sex is binary, but actually even that is being deconstructed more and more. There's more and more research done on intersex people um, and how extremely common intersex conditions are on hormonal levels, on chromosomal levels, on physical levels. Uh, primary and secondary sex characteristics, they all point to the fact that we can't really conceptualize us of humans as being like kind of one or the other. Um, and instead it's also like, it's also a spectrum and a scale. Um, so for most 18, Okay, I've already talked about this, even though I didn't want to. Um, so, so for ex as much as as beef as Marxists have with postmodernism, we also really need to acknowledge that postmodern and post-structuralist thinking shook up bourgeois uh, kind of beliefs on scientific racism and conceptualization of races and of gender and of bodies, and that you know we can be we can be accommodating to that and, and thank them for that. So, I think to conclude from these observations that I've kind of laid out and tried to introduce is that the Marxist argument in summary is that neither gender nor the monogamous family are eternal institutions based on human nature, but instead that they are historic, that there are specific historical entities and concepts like other so social constructs that arose to control social structures and organizations, for example, the state, gender and the family as we know it are products of a specific stage of human development and they have their basis in material conditions. For Marxists, this means that our understanding of gendered oppression must be rooted in materialist understandings of history. That means concretely that a struggle against gender-based oppression must be a struggle for the self-emancipation of the working class and for the destruction of private property in the state. 
our involvement in queer feminist struggles must con come from a revolutionary position that understands that women and queer people are oppressed and that their oppression is rooted in class society. Lenin uh, stated that Marx is need to be tribunes of the people. Uh, that means that we need to react and address every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, no matter where it appears, no matter what stratum of class of people it affects. To do so, we need to question conceptualizations of gender that are inherently bound up in like, capitalist and bourgeois culture and Western economic structures. Um, <coughs> only with the fall of class society, we can create a system in which gender identities and sexual interactions are no longer ruled by forms of coercion and force, neither socially and economically. I'm about to conclude. Engels has a really cool concluding statement um, that I want to quote. It's not perfect, but I think it's a really good final words. So I quote Engels, uh, what, we can now, what we can now conjecture about the way in which sexual relations will be ordered after the impending overthrow of capitalist, capitalist production is mainly of a negative character, limited for the most part on what will disappear. But what will, be, will there be new? That will be answered when a new generation has grown up, a generation of men who never in their lives have known what it is to buy a woman's surrender with money or any other social instrument of power, a generation of women who have never known what it is to give themselves to a man from any other consideration than real love or to refuse to give themselves to their lover from fear of the economic consequences. When these people are in the world, they will care preciously little about what anybody today thinks about what they ought to do. They will make their own practice and their own corresponding public opinion about the practice of each individual, and that will be the end of it. <laughs>